Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the Traffic Commission hearing uh, to order. Members present, uh, Chief uh, Dave Callahan, City Planner Frank Stringy, Chief Christopher Bright, myself, Paula Genzio, Superintendent of Public Works. If you could join me in a salute to the flag. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have our traffic engineers come up before us again uh, with a couple of more ideas uh, for the Malden Street Squire Road neighborhood. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Nelson. I'm with uh, HNTB, and I'm here with uh, folks from my team. We've got Abby and Elena in the back. And um, I'm going to make a brief presentation about uh, the next steps in our study of the Malden Street neighborhood. Um, and I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. And I also want to thank you for the feedback you've provided. Um, I'm interested in, in some responses to this and, and the discussion that we'll have tonight. Um, so what I wanted to do was uh, the agenda for today is a recap of the last meeting. Uh, we'll just go over one final um, point of information on the existing data review, and then we'll look at kind of the potential traffic circulation modifications that we'd like to discuss with you, and then other recommended improvements, and at the end, pause for questions and input. So just to recap some of the feedback that we heard last meeting, uh, we heard a lot of concerns from folks in the neighborhood that, that the issue that should be addressed is traffic volumes, not speeds. Uh, the, the, the feeling that the traffic information does not capture the number of buses and trucks residents have seen, uh, the, the impact of trucks and heavy vehicles in the neighborhood, um, and the need for uh, quick action on some of these proposed improvements to avoid the impacts from the Popeye's restaurants proposed and, and in the process for Squire Road at Derby Street. There are also concerns raised about the impacts of traffic headed to the Northgate shopping and commercial area north of Squire Road. Uh, and then um, a few issues were discussed about uh, with the cut through traffic, you know, should we look at treating the cut through traffic that's coming from Route 1 different than the traffic cutting through the neighborhood to access the Northgate shopping area. Um, so what I wanted to just point out, so, you know, hearing your concerns about the traffic data, we were able, uh, the, the company that we used for the traffic counts uses a video-based system for making those counts. So we were able to obtain those videos um, and compared the counts that they gave us with, with observations that we made of the video. And we found that um, in cross-checking those, the sample was within about two cars or so within each 15-minute period. So um, I, know that, I know there's been concerns raised about the, the time of year and all of that, but just letting you know that we did take a look at um, how the counts that were recorded compared to that. So I think the biggest issue that was raised last meeting was the request, please do more to address traffic volumes. Um, specifically, we heard comments regarding the traffic volumes on Sigourney Street and Derby Road. Um, you know, overall volumes are too high. It's used by trucks and buses. Um, and concern over the cut through, like I m mentioned, from the new Popeye's restaurant on Squire Road. So. Uh, we as a team put our heads together and have two options for uh, addressing the traffic volumes on those two streets that we'd like to present to you and get your feedback on. Uh, and so uh, before I do that, I just want to revisit the existing traffic volumes so we can keep that in mind. And this is the, the weekday PM peak hour that was counted. And what I've tried to do is emphasize that you'll see that the, the volumes recorded for Sigourney and Derby Road are larger, hopefully making them a little bit easier to see, but just to, to state what they are, we saw we recorded volumes of 221 cars per hour and 304 cars per hour on Sigourney Street going northbound, um, and 85 and 78 cars on Derby Road. And then you can see also a sample of how those vehicles are turning at the intersections on each end, um, noticing that you have you know, on Sigourney, Ro uh, Sigourney, uh, Sigourney Street, you've got 71 cars turning left to enter Sigourney, where you have 172 turning right to enter Sigourney. Um, and similarly, when Sigourney meets up with Squire Road, 
you kind of have a, you have a, not an even, but a dispersal of traffic with 138 turning left, 109 going through, and 57 going right. Um, and we have the data on the others, but I just wanted to show these to compare them back to, the, to what we were talking about. And you can see that the volumes on the other streets are, um, especially compared to Sigourney, are smaller. So we've come up with two potential interventions that could be made to help reduce the volumes on both streets. Uh, the first one is what we're calling a diagonal diverter. And we come up with the idea that you could place a diagonal diverter at Derby Road and Grover Street. I mean, I'll go into a little more detail of what that would mean for traffic circulation. And the second is looking at the potential for a median barrier on Malden Street at Sigourney Street. So let me show you what those mean in a little more detail. So a diagonal diverter is put at a four-way intersection and basically it, it um, I'll show you the circulation in a second, but it prevents through traffic um, and, and requires the traffic to turn around this kind of central diverter. Um, and it's something that you can, like you see here, could be implemented through what we call quick build techniques. Um, you could put delineators and paint in to try it out, see if it works. Um, and then similar interve interventions uh, have been shown to result in 35% volume reduction. And for Derby Road, that would be somewhere in the vicinity of 27 cars an hour, so a car every two minutes. Um, so what that would look like is, you can see in the schematic on, on the right, um, so if Derby, Derby Road is, the, is kind of in the north-south orientation here, uh, what you could do is you could put a diagonal diverter from the southeast corner up to the northwest corner, preventing through traffic on Derby Road. So that would mean all traffic coming south from Squire Road could not turn right onto Grover or go through. It would be forced to go left on Grover. Um, and what that would do is, because of the concern about U-turns from Popeyes, that would prevent anybody leaving the Popeyes from going back to Sigourney. Um, so that addresses that primary concern, um, but it also changes the circulation pattern in the neighborhood. Um, and so what you're seeing also, that means the opposite direction. Anyone coming in from Grover Street that wants to access Derby Road south of Grover Street would have to use Derby Road, um, excuse me, Grover Street to navigate around that to go south. And so um, on the left, you can see what those two movements look like in the scheme of the, the greater um, neighborhood. So anybody who, say, lives on the southern end of Derby Road and wants to get there from Squire Road, they'd no longer be able to take a right on Derby and just carry on through. They would have to turn right on Augustus, then use Grover and come down. Similarly, anyone currently coming down Derby Road would be diverted to Grover Street, where their next opportunity to turn down to Malden Street would be at Gore Road. So you, it, it's something that... It change, I guess the, the idea here is that it, it, it um, prevents the move that was raised as a concern, uh, but like any of these things, any turn restriction for one purpose does have kind of follow-on effects. The second one we're, we're proposing for discussion is a median barrier. Could you speak up just a little bit? Oh, sure. Is a median barrier on Malden Street at Sigourney Street. So this is what that would look like as a temporary installation. So what you can see is that there's been um, vertical delineators. They look like wiffle ball bats installed down the double yellow line of the main road. And that would prevent vehicles from taking a left turn across uh, into, the, into the street. Um, so in the case of Sigourney Street, that would be 71 vehicles that, could no long, that would no longer be taking that left. Again, similarly to the diagonal diverter, it can be implemented through quick build techniques. And similar restrictions based on our research have been shown to, to decrease volumes by about 31%. Again, that kind of turn restriction does change circulation patterns slightly. Um, and so we're showing them here. You can see in the light green line, any, we expect cars that want to go from Malden Street to Squire Road would no longer turn left on Sigourney Road, uh, Street but would actually turn on Augustus and then use Grover to move over to the northern part. So this is not something that, that would keep volumes necessarily off the northern part of Sigourney Street, just the southern. Uh, but it would break up how they access that. And you know there'd be a small benefit from the added traffic on Grover uh, because you, you'd be moving from something where there's maybe more often a, a conflicting vehicle. So the stop sign, um, you'd actually have people waiting and pausing. Then the 
Other part of that circulation change would be anyone living on the southern half of Sigourney uh, Street would have to uh, actually use other local roads to turn around to make that left. So in this case, we're showing them using Orvis and Rumney to do that. Um, another potential solution, because you'd be cutting off some of the volume on Sigourney Street, is you could look into making Sigourney Street two-way so that you could uh, up to Grover Street so that you could have the small amount of local traffic come down from Grover Street. Um, again, so, uh, you know, these hopefully or were meant to address some of the concerns that were raised about decreasing volumes on those two streets. Um, but we did want to make sure that you were all aware that there are other circulation changes that happen because of that. So we just wanted to, I guess, pause there and see if this feels like the right kind of solution for what you were looking for or not, um, or if you have any other feedback on what we've presented. Does anyone wish to comment on what, sure, come, come right up. Hey, hey, please come up and use the microphone um, so the folks at home can hear what's going on. Kelly was in the 75 Grover. Um, as I appreciate you looking into the volume. I think, like, you, we didn't want to push the traffic to the other street in the first one. I think pushes that to the other street on making it them only take a turn on Derby Street. And I know this is going to sound silly, but I live at the corner of that house, and I don't want those poles in front of my house. <laughs> okay. It just, it looks ugly. But besides that, it's going to push, it's going to push the uh, traffic up Derby. If you're going to just make them go down Grover, they're just, just all going to go down Grover, and then they're going to take, was it Orvis the next one? Uh, Orvis is one way, so it would be Gore. Gore, and it's going to, yeah, and it's going to make them take, it's going to make them take Gore. I mean, as we don't want to deal with the traffic, I don't want to push the traffic to their streets either. Okay. I had a, a thought. I mean, could we put signs at the end of Derby for a, through traffic certain time to certain time and do what you guys suggested, making the street smaller by lines? Mm -hmm. I mean, only through traffic certain times to certain ti times. Like a residence only. A residence like only that. certain time to certain time. Maybe they could do something like that on um, the Gurney Street. Make the street smaller like you, like you wanted to do. Maybe that'll help the volume, help the situation. I'm not sure, but just a suggestion. Okay, that, that is a good suggestion. I, th I think some of these things that are being proposed is as cars see what's there, that they get discouraged from, from using these roads, that they don't want to go through coming up Derby and taking a left. I know that I'm going to run into something when I get up there. Let me just keep going. It's, it's kind of a, a way of discouraging people uh, from using those roads because they don't feel like manipulating all these lefts and rights and what have you. So I think that's, that's part of the uh, uh, rationale be uh, behind this. So, um, as far as resident only, that has been notoriously difficult to enforce, um, but it, it is an option and, and we can certainly keep that on the table. Anyone else wish to speak? Debbie? Kelly kind of answered some of the things and you know that she said about pushing it off because I mean everyone going left would push it all to Charger who has the second most traffic as to Sigourney. So everyone that's gonna go there is gonna go down Charger Street. Right. So once they get used to that, that that would be discouraging to them because if, if you're coming up Derby, you're coming off of Squire Road. I don't think you'd want to come Go back, back and come no, down. Yeah, so, yes, that would happen initially, I'm sure. Right. But then people would hopefully get discouraged and not come up there. And then the same thing, Augusta Street is going to be used like it did before, right. and that didn't work exactly. out. Exactly. Like, you know, yeah, when you're so. talking a fire apparatus or something, trying to go right. up and turn and go down. So people knowing they can't take the left on Sigourney yeah. would take the street in front of exactly. it. Yes, that, that's true. And I agree. I wouldn't want those in front of my house either with the poles or anything. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else wish to speak on, on, you'll have opportunities to speak, but. Would we like to be able to speak later? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. If, if you wanted to, you can, you can state what you want to state right now. 
My name is Christine Robertson. I reside at 187 Charge Street, and I notice you haven't addressed that at all. And we have just as much traffic, maybe just a little less hourly, than Sigourney Road. And uh, I think that needs to be addressed, and I think you just ignore the whole thing. I really do, and it's kind of a sad situation. It took me 15 minutes to get out of my driveway this evening because of rush hour traffic, mm -hmm. and I think your numbers are wrong. Thank you. I, um, I didn't mean to, um, we have more slides about other improvements in the community, so I apologize for not getting to those before your comments, but we do have countermeasures proposed for Charger as well, so we can take a look at those. Okay, well, there'll be opportunity to make more comments, so if you, if you want to continue. Sure, yep. Um, so in addition to the circulation changes, uh, we're proposing traffic calming measures as well. Um, and on this map, uh, what we're showing with the red dots is the two locations that we already discussed. So that we can, and in blue, it's meant to highlight the traffic calming measures. Um, and so since the, um, the median and the diverter would still probably route the same amount of traffic to the northern end of Sigourney, we're suggesting um, speed humps uh, as a way to discourage traffic and, and, and especially address the issue of people speeding to try and meet the green. So if we can slow traffic, uh, the, the green at Squire Road specifically. Uh, so speed humps would be something, or feedback signs would probably be a good countermeasure there to help prevent people from, from uh, speeding. Uh, and then similarly, uh, two interventions that we're proposing for uh, Charger, given that it is also the street that cuts through to, to Squire Road, would be speed humps um, at regular intervals so that you, you kind of avoid the idea that people just slow down for one specific speed hump and then speed up. Um, and then also uh, something at the uh, a sidewalk or curb extension um, at the Charger Street entrance to Malden Street to, to also kind of basically provide a transition between what's a, a more major street at Malden Street into the neighborhood street. Um, and the, the details of the design of that can, can vary. Um, and then finally, uh, another intervention at, um, excuse me, at Lantern Road and Steeple Street, uh, specifically because it was raised that many, since Lantern Road is a one-way southbound and Steeple is a one-way northbound, um, and, and the, the kind of intersection has a lot of pavement, you sometimes have wrong way traffic going down Steeple Street. So we could do um, an extension to kind of more clearly define uh, that traffic is only coming out of there and discourage people from going through. And that would also have a, a, a benefit for speeds. And then the, the final set of recommend, oh, and just this is what you could potentially do um, temporarily. And, and to the concern about the poles, you know, this isn't necessarily something that has to be there full time. Um, if this is a countermeasure or an intervention that works um, and prevents the, and changes the volumes, there are ways to put more permanent things in there. You can put planters in there, you can uh, build curb and things like that that would be more attractive. But I understand your concern about the, the delineators. <clears throat> um, and this is just an example from Dorchester. Um, and then this is a kind of a graphic view of what you could potentially do to narrow the Steeple Street approach um, and redirect it. So you can see here uh, the, the existing conditions on the left um, and on the right, you could provide some sort of temporary paint um, and the, to, to basically uh, channel the Steeple Street traffic so that they're at a right angle with lanterns. So it's a safer approach for Steeple Street and it would discourage cars heading southbound from using Steeple Street by accident. Uh, the only thing that would have to change from this is that there are driveways to those houses, so they, would have, they wouldn't be striped off. There would still be access through there. I don't understand. Can you go over that, please? Sure, sure. Sure. Uh, uh, how the driveways would... No, it would not. All it would do, all this would do was that if you were coming south on Lantern, as you approach Steeple, right now it almost looks like you can just bear to the left and take Steeple. Correct. Sorry if I can't... Um, what this would do is it would put paint on the ground, almost like you see at, say, like a, a ramp on the highway, so that people would know they can't enter that area, and it would keep them to the right, keep them on lanterns, so that they don't go the wrong way on steeple. And then you would draw the, 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 the area so that cars coming north on steeple would have to just curve around and approach lantern at more of a right angle, um, which is a safer for turns and for people crossing. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. 
So, and then uh, we have one long-term modification that's recommended, and that's um, petition mass DOT for looking at um, providing access to Patriot Parkway and the street to the north um, onto Squire Road. So creating an intersection there to um, split up, you could provide one more access between the neighborhood streets and Squire Road to help relieve some of the traffic on the other streets. Uh, but we put that as long term because this is a state, you know, state controlled roadway. Um, there'd probably be some analysis and justification that would be necessary. So it would take extra work um, and, um, and coordination with them. So I think, and then this is just, you're right. So it's an additional access point, like I said, I don't think there's anything new on here, but you know, we would need to seek mass, mass stop permission. Yeah, of course. Sure. Mm -hmm. Watch out, watch out. Yeah, I can too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll make a comment from here. Ralph DeChico, uh, 49 Washington Street, Rivera. Um, I grew up on Pitcon Street. My family still resides there. Now that you opened up Patriots Parkway for an opening going to Squire Road, why would we want another opening onto Squire Road? If we're going to petition the state for anything, we should close the entrances going across Squire Road to not open anymore because that's just opening up invitation for people to go through more neighborhoods to cross through and go to Squire Road. Petition the state to close the Sigourney Street opening there. They've done it in richer communities, Peabody, uh, Danvers, and down on the South Shore. If we're going to petition the state for anything, do not open another access from Squire Road. Close the access from Squire Road. This will eliminate all the traffic in these neighborhoods. Sigourney, Asunta, uh, um, Derby, all the streets, all the streets off of Squire Road. That will eliminate all the traffic because everybody is trying to use those cut-throughs to get to Route 1, to get to Boston, to get to Northgate. The state wants to have a rotary there close the intersections going through Squire Road across it. That's what needs to be done. So if we're petitioning the state, that's what we should be petitioning for. Close them. Thank you, Ralph. Anyone else wish to make any comments? Any other comments? Oh, go right ahead. Michelle Kelly, Derby Road. I just have a question. So what Dominic was just saying, would that include the traffic coming out of Northgate on to, going on to Squire Road as well at that um, intersection there where... If, if they were to close those intersections, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be able to come out either. You so would have to, you, everyone no would exit. have to go right around the rotary and then back. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Gennaro Cataldo, 35 Augusta Street. I, I had a question to our consultants. I think you've done a very good job with the information you have. Is it possible to bring up the screens regarding Augustus? Because I see two impacts to that that I'd just like to share with you. Is it this one here? That yeah, that one right there, that's a good yeah. one. One of the things we did note is if you start using Augusta Street, and I mean, everything looks really good here, but that impact of that center barrier on Malden Street that we spoke of, that was spoken of, is going to bring the traffic down to Augustus before they go in. And somebody had mentioned that earlier, mm -hmm. is not impact the streets. I applaud that. <clears throat> I think that's a good idea that we, you know, address the fact that that's going to impact it. I do want you to keep in mind, though, as we do this, when we did do the studies, they were, of course, Sigourney was much higher. Derby Road coming from Squire toward um, Grover and Augusta Street on the tested side, which was going northerly, so southerly Derby versus northerly Augustus, those numbers were about the same in the summertime. I think they were the similar numbers also during your period, obviously the seasonality impacting it there too. So I just wanted to bring that forward that I'm not too crazy about the idea of using Augustus for that purpose of zigzagging over and then coming off the uh, highway as it is. I mean, that is a fact. That's what we live with right now. No issue with that, but that zigzag is going to cause uh, additional traffic on Augustus. Lower end by the southern end of it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Can I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Sure. 
regarding that left-hand turn. What, what is the difference in the, in the left-hand turn movements versus the right-hand turn movements on Sigourney? To Sigourney? Yeah. So right now, about uh, this is in the PM peak hour, which was the highest volume. It's about 75 cars taking a left to enter Sigourney and 175 taking a right. So it's the smaller of the movements. Okay, any further comments? I have something to say, but I want to Sure, jump right up. No, go right ahead. Yeah, we could say whatever you want. <laughs> Within reason. <laughs> Good evening, traffic commissioners. I am Christine Robertson. I reside at 187 Charger Street, one of the two streets that are a main thoroughfare to Northgate Shopping Center, as well as to the northeast end of Charger Street that takes traffic into the shopping center, as well as the multiple businesses, apartment buildings that are in the area at the end of the street, as well as the DPW. Due to illness, I apologize for not being able to attend the last meeting and was so disappointed that none of my neighbors were here to represent the street. I have sent multiple comments and statements to HNTB via Laurie, who was so very kind to be read into the minutes of the meeting, but alas, it was not done. I later sent the same comment statements to Mr. Argenzio for his review. I did watch the meetings on YouTube and gathered a lot of information from both meetings. In the meeting of February 16th, there were many suggestions for slowing down the traffic on the impacted neighborhoods, speed humps, bumps, painted lines on the streets, etc. As we all know, not much any of these things will decrease the amount of traffic that both Charter and Sigourney Street endure. It may slow down the traffic, it will not decrease the number of cars daily. Derby Street is a separate situation and I empathize with that area. There is also a 700 plus difference in cars per day between Charger, Sigourney and Derby Road. It was also mentioned that, that only five trucks per day drove down Charger Street. I have counted over 18 trucks in one day. Are you including Amazon, UPS, FedEx, USPS, city trucks, school buses, construction equipment? As a past speaker said, I invite you to sit in my house for a week. I too, too invite you to sit in my dining room for a week to observe the traffic on Charger Street. Just to mention, Lanton Road is in the same predicament as Derby Road. They are the first right after the signal crossing Spire Road from Charger Street. They too bear the burden of multiple cars per day. I did some research on the MassDOT website and spoke with several agents at MassDOT on February 23rd. Chapter 89, Section 9, specifically is of interest for streets that intersect with Commonwealth roadways. This chapter alludes to the streets that directly intersect with a Commonwealth roadway that have signals slash traffic lights. I read and reread the section multiple times and still could not completely understand what it meant. I guess you have to have a law degree to understand the legalese. So I called MassDOT and was directed to Sector 4, Arlington office that oversees this area and spoke to Linda, a MassDOT agent. She stated that the Commonwealth is only concerned with the flow of traffic that the Commonwealth Roadway, Squire Road, intersects with that have signals and traffic light, which is Sigourney Street and Charger Street. And the city has control over city streets. Their main concern is the traffic flow on Squire Road. Thus, if this is a request for a traffic flow on a city street, it is up to the city to decide if it is in the best interest of the impacted neighborhood to make the change. I also asked about signs posted on city streets and was told that any signs posted on city streets are to be enforced by the city as they are not under state control. So I guess the no truck signs, the corner of Charger and Malden Street and Remney Road and Charger Street are enforceable by the, enforceable by the traffic division and our local police. Perhaps inviting MassDOT to these meetings to clarify, like, clarify all of these issues would be of help. It was also suggested at the February meeting that, and I may be mistaken and did not hear it correctly, that no right turn sign should be placed along Malden Street for Charger Street and for Sigourney Street. Now, how are the people that live at that end of the street going to get to their homes? As a suggestion, I saw on Harris Street at the intersection of American Legion Highway and Harris Street a do not enter sign with posted hours on it. The states, they state specific hours that traffic cannot use the street, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. I don't know if these hours are abided by and enforced, but would like that be of some help to deter some of the traffic off these streets. Only residents could bypass the sign that would be easy to check due to the new permit stickers 
that have been sent out to residents and had to be on our car windshields. The LED speed box was placed on Charger Street midday Wednesday, February 22nd, and was removed February morning, February 24th. This was placed right before and during a significant snow event and absolutely did not capture the amount of traffic that uses Charger Street on a daily basis. And to add insult to injury, we drove down the street at 8 p.m. on Thursday, February 23rd, and the screen was totally blacked out and not showing any speed rate of passing cars. I learned that the speed box was removed due to plowing issues from the storm. It has yet to been replaced. I hope that we on Charger Street will have the same opportunity that other streets have had where it's been placed for more than a week. There was mention of parking on the pathways. Many years ago, it was explained to me that these asphalt sidewalks, for lack of a better description, are considered pathways. The definition of a pathway is a path for people to walk on, not to be parked on. Well, if we did park on the street, on these streets, and not the pathways, no one would be able to get down the streets and it would be extremely narrow. Maybe we should all consider parking on the streets properly, leaving the pathway for pedestrians to walk on as it should be and see what happens to the traffic flow. I know that I see people walking in the street every single day because cars are parked on the pathways and people are unable to use the pathway. Perhaps putting sidewalks in these neighborhoods would help. It seems that all this time and money has been spent for naught as we all still live with the increasing amount of traffic, emissions, trash, and noise daily, and no one affected by these requested traffic flows, change is happy. The suggested changes are not going to work for everyone. Instead of bringing the neighbors together, there is now discord, animosity, and hard feelings. How very sad that there are no winners for the homeowners and taxpayers in these impacted neighborhoods. The mindset seems to be not on my street. Unfortunately, this is a no-win situation for anyone that lives in these neighborhoods. All I can say is, this should remain as they have been, as they have been for many, many years. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Ralph Ciano, 156 Lanton Road. I, I have a compelling need, really, to follow Christine on that. Uh, Lanton Road being right next to um, Charger Street, and she brought up some very valid points. I submitted this email to the NT NTP gang, uh, to the police department, some months ago, and I just want to share it for the audience. Uh, and I, again, like Christine, I empathize with Sigourney and, and the folks on Derby, Derby Road, but I stand before you because um, Lantern Road seems to be the stepchild in this whole thing. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that, again, you know, one of the main entrances, you come up out of Northgate, you take the left, you take the first right, there's Derby, bang. Uh, we have the same issue uh, coming out of Northgate, take the left, the first right, bang, there's Lenton Road. Uh, so we're akin to those, those kinds of issues. Um, but I want to share with you uh, the nightmare that we've been um, living on Lenton Road for, for years, and again, um, my family built a home in 66, and we have lived here since the current day. Back then, Northgate did not exist, but instead, it was the airport, from Rotary to Rotary, where the Sheridan Hotel is now. Very quiet and serene. Current day brings many, many vehicles up the one-way street, Lanton Road, many times speeding throughout the day in an inordinate large steady flow during peak hours as your traffic numbers and study attest to. I believe we are only second behind Patriots Parkway for high volume flowing and coming from Squire Road towards Malden Street, based on the numbers you provided. Residents like me who live in the street must constantly endure the wrath of pass-through traffic from all City of Revere Public Works vehicles, which has as its garage located close to Northgate Squire Road. These vehicles range from pickup trucks to heavy equipment to payloaders and the like and many other specialty trucks, small and large, which is what Christine said. What goes up my street comes down her street. They carry dirt and grime on their tires and trucks, which are dispersed throughout the street as they proceed. During the season, the street sweepers are no use because they do a poor job to mitigate this level of filth, regardless of complaint to the city yards and city hall. This traffic flow is heavy. And in parens, uh, whatever happened, whatever became of the sign on the street, no trucks. 
Another paragraph, U.S. Postal Service trucks also use the street as a cut through to get to the other side to Malden Street and to West Revere. Their garage is also on the opposite side of Route 60 near North Gate, which uses a charge street to Lanton Road as a steady road. This flow is constant. Amazon trucks, UPS trucks, FedEx trucks, as well as any other commercial trucks and vans, as well as food delivery trucks, constantly roll up the street relentlessly throughout the day. And one of the worst examples of the messy, many passenger trucks driving up the street during peak hours, which are speeding, trying to get to the other side of West Revere. I feel for the folks on Derby Road in their quest for traffic trial and study, and I understand their dilemma. But the Derby Road traffic volume does not even come close to the constant volumes of steady traffic, including abusive flow of speeders that those of us on Lanton Road have had to endure for the past 20 years and growing worse and worse by the day. I do not know what the answer is to mitigate and otherwise disperse the traffic around and away from Lanton Road, but whatever you decide, please make the right choice and give the many hardworking, taxpaying citizens and residents of this area uh, some degree of relief and get us out of this nightmare. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. So obviously this isn't an easy issue. Um, the, there's been many comments here about bringing in the state mass DOT. So maybe we can ask, or we can ask, our, um, our state reps to get involved and uh, our traffic engineers to petition mass DOT and ask them to look into the feasibility of closing those two uh, cut-throughs at Sigourney and at Charger and also ask them uh, if they have any input on making Derby Road, uh, Lantern Road, and Gore Road do not enters. So that would essentially keep pushing the, the traffic down, uh, down Squire Road to the Rotary. Um, if our traffic engineers could do that, and maybe we can get Mass DOT here, uh, because that seems to be the bone of contention, and, and we're looking for long-term solutions, obviously, than, than short-term. Um, but we will still try and work on mitigating speed on, on these streets on our own, which we can do. Uh, would that be satisfactory if we could bring Mass DOT in on this and ask them these questions, and if it's feasible, and if they would be open to some of these things? that um, yeah I, I just to note um, mass DOT did a, a study of that section that corridor route 60 mm -hmm. from uh, Brown Circle to Copeland Circle and their own recommendation was to close those medians because they wanted to see traffic flow more smoothly down okay. Squire Road uh, and keep traffic moving so what came out of there uh, it's called the lower uh, North Shore transportation study. It was done about 20 years ago, <laughs> but it was never implemented by Mass DOT. And it also included improvements at Brown Circle, also to make that more efficient. So it's uh, it's something they thought about and uh, they wanted to pursue it. They had it as a viable option. So okay, no, we can definitely bring it to the table one more time, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Yes. The reason why it's never been implemented. Do I need to say why? It's because of where Revere. We need to stick together and put pressure on them. Um, that's what needs to be done. It's a long time coming. How many years have we heard they were going to do something with Bell Circle? <laughs> Squire Road is not something that should be a burden to the residents in this area. There's people that are making money in there, at Northgate. Why should this be affecting the neighborhoods there? If you go, like I, I said, Peabody, Danvers, you don't see any of those neighborhoods being impacted like Rivera's. They, they were all shut down. The, the, all those medians were closed. We, we need to put pressure and great suggestion to get our, our state delegation and pressure mass, mass DOT. We never get anything in Rivera. We need to put pressure and our state delegation needs to put pressure on them. It's, there's no more, you know, we have to reroute the traffic in our neighborhoods that I, I can almost guarantee if those medians are shut down, you'll see this traffic go away in the neighborhoods because the only people that will be using those streets is the residents. 
not the people trying to cut through, going from different cities, going to Northgate, trying to go to East Boston, going to Everett, trying to get to Route 1. What actually should be done there too? Those rotaries should be gone. Why do we even have rotaries? What should be done in Revere is what they did in Wellington Circle. It should be lights, no rotaries. Why is okay. Revere always forgotten? DOT needs to step up, put their money where their mouth is, and do the correct way for the city of Revere and the residents of Revere. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. Um, so that's our next step. Uh, if you could do that for us, petition the state um, with those scenarios, and when they get back to us, or maybe we can have them come here and uh, the residents and the traffic commission can question them and ask these questions. All right. Mr. Thank Chairman. you very much. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Just one more thing. I think we can look at that. We can look at a modified version of that where you would not have allow a right-hand turn, uh, only allow a right-hand turn off Derby, only allow a right-hand turn off Charger, so no through turn or left hand left turn. And then you maintain a left-hand turn into Northgate Center and left-hand turn into Charger Street from Squire Road only. That would allow people to at least get into those streets uh, coming from the north without having to go all the way around the circle and back. So that's, that's an option we can look at. And that would definitely dissuade people from cutting down those streets if they can't go left or straight through. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Kelly, we've to 75 Grover. I, I don't even know if I should be addressing you or not, but to that theory, um, twice this week I've almost got killed at the end of Sigourney Street at 5 in the morning taking the left turn turn to go on to Route 1. Mm -hmm. No, the cars, there's double cars there, and you, you the, the right hand usually goes right. Right. Well, they came left with me. Okay. Twice I almost got killed this week. Okay. I don't, I don't know if somebody could put a line directing that, why this is all going on, uh, who does that or whatever. But that's Mass DOT. That's their road, so we can, we well, can it's also. Well, Sigourney Street, the end of Sigourney. At the right, light, I know. Right there. Okay. Okay, all right. We have a... Another presentation here, so we're going to try. Um, to your uh, comment, they should, um, like we have at the end of Charger Street now, when they put in the BJs, they put in the, that second lane to take a left yes. onto. They, they don't have a left-hand arrow. They should have uh, a left-hand arrow, and that also would help when people are coming out of Northgate. Mm -hmm. If there's a staggered arrow on Sigourney going across, so they can take the left to go to Route 1, you'd have less problems at that intersection. I know that's a mass dot issue, but they also deserve have to have a left-hand signal, and I think that would help you guys a, a ton over there. Oh, I'm, they should close them off. I agree. Okay. I'm with you. Close right. them off. So we'll reconvene um, once we get some sort of response from Mass DOT. Thank, thank you great. very much. Thanks, everyone. Well, uh, sh sure. Ralph Ciano, 156 Lenton Road. I just wanted to revisit something. Uh, it's my understanding that in the last two or three years, the bill, uh, call it what you want, has been introduced, uh, sponsored to the Mass DOT from the City Council. I believe it was done through uh, Councilor Rizzo to put a, a breakout lane uh, on Squire Road uh, going into Northgate, uh, you know, that would, you know, at the Sigourney Streetlights, mm -hmm. a, a, double, a double lane and then going left, and possibly the same thing for Charger Street. I mean, I think that would help greatly to some degree. Um, and I'm told that nothing was done about it uh, through the grapevine, and then it was reintroduced again. And I'm wondering if somebody uh, during this process of uh, communications can add that as a bullet point and find out where, where the, what the status of that is as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. This part of the uh, hearing is closed. I'd like to invite <clears throat> HYM to come up. This uh, proposals here for traffic improvements for the Suffolk Downs development in the Beachmont area, uh, pedestrian and traffic safety improvements, and they have a presentation for us uh, that we'd like to listen to.
We're ready. Sorry. Please start when you uh, sure. when you're ready. Um, good to be here. My name is Mike Borowski with the HYM Investment Group. Uh, sure. Good to be here. My name is Mike Borowski. I'm with the HYM Investment Group. We're the developer of Suffolk Downs. We've been in this, uh, we haven't been before the Traffic Commission before, but we've been here uh, before City Council and other groups here in Revere for many years. So we're here today, um, well, I'll, I'm going to cover three different things, or I'll also be covering those with uh, Ian McKinnon here from Howard St. Hudson. He's our traffic engineer. Uh, first, I'll give just a brief overview of Suffolk Downs just to give people a sense of just kind of where we are in the process of the development. Uh, then we're, I'll turn it over to Ian just to walk through some informational items, items that are not here before the commission, but that we just want to make um, the traffic commission aware of just improvements that we're making to the area. And then third, we're going to cover some requested public hearing actions that we would like to be uh, heard. Uh, we'd like to be heard uh, next month's meeting. So I'll start with just a quick overview. Um, as people know, uh, the area outlined in blue that's the Suffolk Downs site. Um, you know, we first purchased the site in 2017 and through a lengthy permitting process with the City of Revere, City of Boston, and with, and with the state, uh, we got our master plan approval back in 2020, uh, fully completed. Um, since then, we've been working on uh, planning for our first set of buildings to be uh, uh, built in Revere, right near the Beachmont T Station. So to that end, um, over the course of that time, we also have worked at length with the City of Revere, MassDOT, MBTA, and DCR as it relates to a series of traffic improvements to happen both in this first phase and then throughout the course of the project as we build out the project. So the first set of, uh, of improvements we will be making, and many of those items will be, again, requesting that public hearing about, are the items identified in red. So there will be traffic improvements um, in the Donnelly Square area, up Winthrop Avenue adjacent to our site, going to Revere Beach Parkway, and then there's a location at the intersection of Route uh, 16, 145, Winthrop Avenue, and Harris Street, and then uh, work in front of the uh, public safety building, which we'll talk about, and then also in front of the high school crosswalk. So that's the entirety of the work that we'll, we'll be doing as part of our first development phase at Suffolk Downs. Just to hone in a little bit more, to get a little bit more detailed, um, you know, we will be um, starting this work. The plan is that we would start this work uh, next summer, and that would that would it would probably run through the uh, middle to the end, probably to the middle of 2024, summer of 2024. Um, you know, this work uh, we're really excited about. This work it's going to create uh, really a boulevard setting along Winthrop Avenue, um, and really works. We're, we're really excited about the improvements that will be made. Um, I'll let. I'll turn it over to Ian in just a second. I did want to call out just a couple quick items that we are excited about. Is one is uh, work in front of the public safety building uh, and creating a new curb cut there to allow for uh, better fire truck access across rent, across uh, Revere Beach Parkway uh, and the adjustment of a curb cut to allow trucks to exit the building in a in a more safe way. Um, that's one of the items that's more informational in nature, not before the traffic commission, but just wanted to point that out. So with that, I will turn it over uh, to Ian McKinnon. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you. My name is Ian McKinnon, uh, traffic engineer from Howard Stein Hudson in Boston. Um, so as Mike mentioned, uh, I'm going to go over a couple improvements here. Some of them are informational in nature. Some of them we're actually going to request for a public hearing. Um, so I'll start off here. Uh, and I, again, a lot of these, um, feel free to, to ask questions at the end. Um, but again, these are all part of a package of about 62 locations, nine of which which are tied to the first phase of development, the corner of, um, of Washburn and, and Winthrop. So in front of the fire station um, in the public safety building along Revere Beach Parkway, there's a plan in front of you. You can see um, the, the big improvement here is that um, will, which will benefit public safety in the community at large is the break in the median. And so today there is a long median along Revere Beach Parkway that requires trucks to exit out to the right only. And so what this will allow is quick and much reduced uh, response time heading to the west and the broader parts of, of Revere. Um, and so actually in the firehouse itself, we plan to install a switch so that it, you can turn the lights on, stop 
traffic coming down Revere Beach Parkway and then actually flush out any remaining vehicles that are in between this fire station and uh, North Shore Road. So um, what, what that allows is the re first responders to have a very clear path. It'll flush all the vehicles out and so um, it'll also allow for um, some increased uh, maneuverability. So this curb cut here you see um, is kind of offset from the existing um, fire station. And so what we're proposing to do is actually shift that so it's directly in front of the, the fire truck doors. So it'll be much easier for especially those big ladder, the ladder one, to actually exit out of this garage. Um, and so the other benefit to this is on return as well. There'll be direct access um, fire, um, as part of the fire preemption system. They'll be able to stop traffic and, and directly get access back into the firehouse. Um, as also part of this project, there'll be an extended left turn lane heading into uh, North Shore Road. All the sidewalks are getting upgrades and um, some um, pavement markings and, and other um, sort of surface level improvements as well. So that's uh, the first place. The next uh, place is at uh, Revere. Question, Ian, before sure. we move on. Uh, regarding uh, the median opening in front of the fire station, that's only good for emergency Correct. Vehicle It'll be use. signed. What are we um, doing for prevention of vehicles taking a left through that median cut? So they'll be signed and it'll be designed such that it'll be hard to take a left from Revere Beach Parkway East. Um, and we also plan to put a sort of a, a scored concrete in the middle there so it's not exactly going to be comfortable driving over. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. One question I have. Is that a utility pole there? Yes. So. How are we going to relocate that? Or, yeah, I'm sure you guys already have, kind of have that planned out. Yeah. yeah. So we're working with the City of Revere, um, who's also working, who's working with National Grid uh, related to the relo relocation of that pole. It is important. That pole does need to be relocated in order for us to move that, move the entry to be aligned with the building. So that is, that's something we're working with, uh, with the City of Revere Planning Department on currently. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? All right, so the next location, uh, this is uh, Route 60, American Legion Highway. Um, plan uh, to the right is north, uh, and this is just outside uh, the, the old Neco and directly adjacent to uh, the high school. So we understand that there was an imminent need for student safety to create a safe crossing, uh, particularly to connect to uh, the Shirley Avenue neighborhood. And so under this plan, um, there would be a new traffic light that would stop traffic in both directions and allow um, anyone to cross the street, uh, particularly during the school rush hours. Um, this this uh, plan calls for a sidewalk extension that connects directly into the high school path that you can see, uh, sort of north center of the screen there. Um, and there's also gonna be a break in the fence, but it'll be a sort of a channelization type so that uh, you, kids and anyone that's crossing just directly crosses and doesn't try to walk down the median, which they, they tend to do today. Uh, this intersection will also have a number of sidewalk upgrades, um, new pavement markings to, to facilitate this. Um, and the other thing is uh, we've kind of teed up uh, the end of Harris Avenue to reinforce that it's just a exit only, mm -hmm. right out only, because today you could easily slip right up the hill. And just so, if I could pause one moment. Yeah, sure. This, this isn't a public hearing. Oh. The, the, everything that's presented here will be at our next okay. uh, public, and then the public know, input. Years ago, when uh, there was Necco there, right. we had asked them to put a pedestrian bridge right. for the kids. So you, you'll be able to access that to make these right. statements uh, next month at the public hearing. Not, not to shut you down, but it's, okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Question, Ian. Yeah. Uh, what's the current status of the Neco project? Is it completed? Do we have the funding for that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's the sort of extents of this location. We understand this was critical and, and important to the mm -hmm. community, so it has been moved up in sort of the, the sequencing of all the offsite improvements. Mm -hmm. And it'll be one of the first locations that we construct. All right, um, the third, and this is the kind of uh, captures the, the last sort of informational items. Um, we understand that um, under Title 10, there's a sort of a directory of all the bike paths in town. Um, What's important here is consistent with sort of the master plan of the entire Suffolk Downs, there's going to be a series of many publicly accessible paths, green spaces, um, and trails. And um, um, one of the chief among them, and the, one of the first ones that will be completed is this path that's along um, Winthrop Avenue. And that's sort of on the southern side, on the, the Beachmont side of the site. And so what, as Mike mentioned, there's actually gonna be a, it'll feel like a boulevard, but there'll be a very wide promenade 
Um, it's something like 25 feet-ish wide. Um, and there'll be a two-way bike path and a sidewalk split between of which will be a, a row of trees. There'll be new lighting. So it'll be a very pleasant place to walk. Um, and as part of this, so there'll be about 620 feet is the first section of that. And that runs from um, Washburn down to uh, Winthrop or uh, Riviera Beach Parkway in both directions. So there'll be an eastbound and a westbound bike path there. There'll also be another short segment of bike, bike, bike path uh, within Donnelly Square. Um, and that is key to the long range vision of the extension of the Mary Ellen Welch Greenway that extends from East Boston all the way up to Revere Beach Parkway. So again, these are additional designated bike facilities within the city of Revere. These, we intend to these to connect to the train station so that people can um, use them to access um, the train or just to connect to um, the other amenities within the city. Um, long term, there, this, this path will extend all the way down to North Shore Road, um, and there will be a number of other paths with, internal to the site as well. So now moving on, uh, a couple items um, that we do request uh, a public hearing on, um, the first of which um, is south of Donnelly Square, and this is, involves the Crescent Avenue. Um, so Crescent Avenue today has a, a very wide um, slip lane that kind of just slides right into um, Bennington Street on the northbound side. And so what, what's proposed here is a series of geometric changes. And what I mean by that is changing the way that people interact with Crescent and Bennington. And so what we know is roads are a lot safer when they come together at a 90 degree angle. And so what happens here is we, we're proposing to um, realign Crescent Avenue and so that anybody that's coming down westbound Crescent Avenue can get at the back of the line uh, at Bennington and also allow you to change quickly over into the left-hand turn lane because that's kind of a very hard move today to get into the left-hand turn lane um, even if there's one or two vehicles sitting there at the light. Um, and so what this does is creates um, a lot of uh, open space as well since um, that area is no longer needed. There'll be some public open space much safer um, sidewalk conditions. We understand obviously the uh, elementary school is just to the south here. And so um, all of these conditions um, are, are, are made and preserve all of the parking and all of the residential access as well. So um, there's a couple of new driveway curb cuts that we are facilitating on Bennington, but generally speaking, all of the current access is preserved. Um, the other important parts here that we understand is um, there's a series of businesses on the west side of Bennington. Um, and um, from what we've heard, uh, there was a road safety audit conducted in uh, July of 2018, I believe. Um, and one of the, the chief concerns was there's a lot of people that try to scoot out of the, the Dunkin' Donuts blocks traffic. It's very dangerous, as we all understand. And so there'll be a small median that's placed there that will allow only sort of right in, right out only. So it should really regularize the intersection, which in and of itself will make the intersection a little bit more safe. Um, ultimately, um, Donnelly Square itself is going to see a, a large slew of other improvements, new traffic signals, new sidewalks, shorter crossings that will bring much needed safety to this area right next to the T where it's, it's very congested. So there is no changes to the number of lanes, um, but just a very large sort of investment in, in this area that sees a lot of, of people coming together. So. The proposed change here is the, the geometry changes of Crescent Avenue. Uh, the next item um, is just sort of plan west, it's moving um, just underneath the MBTA Blue Line Bridge uh, to Win Winthrop Avenue. And so uh, we understand there's a series of MBTA bus stops that uh, um, integrate with the Blue Line here. Uh, this is the, the 119 bus. Um, and so there's two big changes related to the bus stop that goes inbound or eastbound and one related to going to the one uh, westbound. So on the inbound direction, there'll be a new bus stop um, adjacent to the Suffolk Down site. And we understand um, that it was a community, uh, that there's community um, interest to actually moving this bus stop because it currently sits and blocks the traffic as it's waiting to offload and unload passengers right in front of the station. And so this bus stop has just been shifted um, just to the other side of Washburn, and it's ex been extended in length. Um, there is a, a way to drive around it, so if the, car, if the bus is stopped there, you can pull around it, but it, it will no longer block that sort of that lane there. 
in the opposite direction, there's actually going to be a bus pull-off. And so the um, drivers will be able to pull off the road um, and not block traffic as, the, as sometimes they do today. Um, and we've actually lengthened that bus stop as well, so it can actually handle two or three buses for any future MBTA plans, or we understand it's actually a layover facility where they, they wait um, midday uh, during shifts. So um, again, this is all improvements directly adjacent to the site. Uh, I will note that there is an existing bus shelter on the north side that is staying. We're relocating that one. And there will be a new bus shelter on the, on the south side as well. Uh, moving just a little bit further west, um, this is just, just adjacent to where we were just looking at. Um, there is a new driveway for Suffolk Downs Boulevard, and it's really going to be one of the gateways to the, the first phase of development. And, and working with the MBTA, uh, what we've proposed to, is to actually create a new four-way intersection. So the existing um, Beachmont parking lot um, driveway access will actually shift to align with this new roadway, so it'll create a four-way intersection. Um, and so this will be a new mid-block crossing, a new traffic signal. Um, and so under this proposal, the city would accept this new traffic signal. Um, this also creates another crossing point. This is quite a long block between uh, Revere Beach Parkway and Washburn to actually cross the road. So it gives another lo um, location to, to break up. There'll be left turn lanes in and out of both sites. So it'll allow for the smooth operation um, of the development and also access to um, the MBTA's parking lot. And you can see here another part of the, the bike, the bikeway and the, the promenade here in the, the green crossing here you see right here. And the, the last item that we wanted to bring up um, involves the intersection improvements at Route 16 and Route 145. Um, generally speaking, the improvements here are um, improvements to mitigate traffic. So um, on the northbound side, there's an extra northbound right turn lane that's been added. Um, and on the south, south side, or, or the southbound side, coming from Bell Circle, there's an extra, uh, there's a new movement that's being allowed, and that's the left turn. Um, so there'll be a double left-hand turn lane there. And the reason for that um, is to remove traffic from what we believe is from cutting through the neighborhood on Harris Street and moving them back onto the regional roadway. Um, today, there isn't a very good access point if you're coming south from Bell Circle to connect to points east and heading towards uh, on Revere Beach Parkway. If you look on a map, it's, it's, a, it's an interchange that should look like a diamond, but they didn't build the north half of it. And so this allows that movement. And so what we believe will happen here um, is the, the, the bulk of the cut through traffic, what we believe are people that are coming down through the Harris Street neighborhood, will actually shift on to that left-hand turn lanes. And um, in order to, to facilitate that, um, we need to change the directionality of the last block um, of Harris Street. And what that'll do is that it'll actually help the whole intersection as a whole. And understand uh, there's some circulation changes, and I'll go over those on the next page on how that happens. But we b really believe that there will be a shift in the regional traffic back onto the regional roadways and not into um, the neighborhood streets. Um, this will also mean that there'll be safer pedestrian crossings. There'll be a small little island there that'll really facilitate a little bit of a shorter crossing um, than exists today. Um, but it also will remove any sort of queuing. Folks that cannot get out of their driveways on that short segment, they'll now be able to get out and, uh, and loop around. And so on the next slide, I'll show you how that works. So if you, if you lived on Harris Street, um, depending on where you're heading, um, you can either go up to Bell Circle and take a couple rights and loop back around. And now you'll be able to take a left to head uh, east on Revere Beach Parkway. Or you could head south if you're heading to points west. Also, you could uh, take uh, Sewell Street and take a quick left um, and connect back down to Winthrop Avenue that way as well. So sort of two options. And, and because we've removed this leg of the intersection, this is really a five-way intersection. Five-way intersections do not work well from a traffic operations perspective. Because we've removed that one extra leg, everybody actually will benefit. And also, it'll actually be a less of a weight by removing that leg, driving around, and getting into the queue, because it'll actually lower all the queues by what we forecast to be about 50%. So um, 
we've reallocated the time that was given to Harris Street to the others, um, and by, by doing so, moved all of the cut through traffic out of the neighborhood, is, is what the goal of this is. So with that, um, we're happy to answer any questions or um, anything else you want to look at, we're happy to look at. Unless Mike, just you one, uh, yeah. Ian. Yeah. Just, uh, just one concern I have is uh, traffic coming uh, uh, eastbound from West Revere down Beach Street, North Revere, those yep. sections, those neighbors coming down Beach Street that ought, that would normally take the right and go down Harris Street now have to go around Bell Circle. Well, not around the whole circle, but take a quick right. Um, that's only one lane now entering the circle, which queues up all the way up Beach Street. Yep. Uh, I, we need to take make some modifications to that to allow a right-hand turn lane so vehicles can continue can right, them, go yeah. on Route 16, and, and get right up there quickly. Yeah, I believe so, yeah. Without interfering with the traffic yeah. that's coming around the circle. Sure. So as part of a later phase of development of Suffolk Downs, there's going to be a huge slew of other investments to Bell Circle as well, and I think this is one of them, if I'm not mistaken. We haven't quite gotten to the level of design with it yet, but um, it's something that's planned. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's needed to make this work more efficiently. Yeah. Have you folks done a, a traffic study like on that stretch of Harris Street? Do you know how many cars go through there a day, or a guesstimate? Yes, so approximately 2,400 cars a day use Harris Street, and and we believe a good portion of them will divert off of that. Yeah. I'll be honest, we've done some studies down there and it's more than 2,400. Yeah. We were hitting it in the middle of the night, 300 cars an hour going through there. And that's in the middle of the night just to yep. avoid the circle. Yep. So hopefully some of these things that you're putting together to mitigate this will help. Yes. Because, uh, you know, the, the neighbors definitely need relief. And I think what Mr. Stringy said too, the other modifications up at the circle. Because, I mean, I'll be honest, we did a count, and one of them was like 5,000. I, I couldn't believe how many cars yeah. a day utilize that stretch, and it's all to avoid the rotary, that bell circle. So, I mean, you guys are the experts, so. What time, I'm just curious, was that recent, or what time of year was it? Yeah, I, I want to say we probably did it in the last uh, 18 months, just because of complaints uh, from the residents. And I'll be honest, I was taken back at how many cars went through the neighborhood yeah, yeah. when I looked at the counter. So if you guys are going to put counters down there, if you leave them there for a little bit, like Sergeant Janino just retired. I wish he was still here because he did the, the count on the streets in multiple different times. And I was taken back because I thought the residents were exaggerating until I saw the, the counts and what come up and the different hours where the traffic just continued yeah. on that street. So they need some relief, and I think this will probably help. Yeah, but it's cool. going to back it up into the rotary because if you guys go there at certain times of day, and I don't know, have you guys sat on the site at all? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You see how that uh, Beach Street area just oh, yeah. backs up beyond Harris? It'll back right up, and I think it's all because of the school and everything else at the same time. Yep. So um, I spoke with Councilor McKenna and. Councillor Ira Novoselsky today, and they asked me to read this letter into the record. Um, they are in favor of all the proposals that you have put forth. This Harris Street is one that they have a little problem with. They asked me to read this into the record, so I, I'm going to do so. Um, dear Chairman Agenzio, this letter is in response to City's Economic Development Director Bob O'Brien's letter to the Traffic Commission relative to support of proposed traffic improvements by the HYM Investment Group. In Mr. O'Brien's letter, he writes, Ward 1 and Ward 2 Councilors Joanne McKenna and Ira Novoselsky have been vocal advocates for the traffic changes now before you. His statement is inaccurate as this is not the case for all changes being presented to the Traffic Commission, specifically the following proposed traffic changes concerning Harris Street. Elimination of the left-hand turn from Harris to Revere Beach Parkway and establishing Harris Street as a one-way street for traffic from Revere Beach Parkway. In our opinion, these proposed changes to Harris Street will be detrimental to the Beachmont and Shirley Avenue neighborhoods by reducing vehicle access points. Motorists who want to get to Beachmont and Shirley Avenue from the west side of the city will have to use Winthrop Ave or Broadway to Revere Beach Parkway. Winthrop Ave at Harris Street is congested now and by eliminating Harris Street 
will only add to the congestion on Winthrop Avenue with the potential to back up to Low Street or even B Street. The residents of the Romney Marsh Cemetery neighborhood, Elm Library, Norman Sewell, Butler, Bixby, and Harris Streets will be inundated with cut through traffic from motorists attempting to get from one side of the city to the other. This neighborhood has already seen its fair share of traffic and inconveniences over the last three years caused by the operation of the food bank located at 196 Winthrop Avenue. We look forward to working with the Traffic Commission to develop a plan that will better serve the residents of this neighborhood, Beachmont and Shirley Avenue. And it's signed Joanne McKenna and Ira Novoselsky. So they have a little problem with the, the last proposal you have, and I'm sure they'll be, and they will both be here for the public meeting in, in April. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so we, just as a side <coughs> note, um, uh, Tom O'Brien from HYM did meet with Councilor Novoselsky and Councilor McKenna yesterday to, mm -hmm. just to walk them through the details of the intersection. Um, so, you know, we'll look forward to ongoing discussions with them. Um, and just kind of getting more into the details, some of the details from Howard Stein Hudson, the, uh, the traffic counts and how, how, what the functionality is, what it will be of this intersection. So, um, but look forward to working with them over the next month and okay. in advance of the next hearing. Thank you very much. Short time now. Good evening, everybody. Tom Skrowski, Chief of Planning Community Development for the city. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly um, both in support of these improvements and to a degree in response to the letter that you just read aloud, um, which was also co-signed by myself along with uh, Director of Economic Development, Bob O'Brien. Um, just to note that was just a draft seeking input um, and we have since corrected the record, uh, drafted a new um, letter which I believe all the commissioners received this evening, uh, just expressing our support for this project. You know, it, admittedly I'm pretty new here still just coming on in October and I know this has come on the heels of over five years of planning with the development advisory group with of course the folks here at the table today um, project review team at the city the city council and of course the rigorous MEPA approval process as well so this has really been through the ringer I think the developers have done a great job working with the community to put together this set of proposals that ultimately is all about mitigating impact right and I think we see a lot of great um, proposals that will help improve the pedestrian oriented environment here, but also removing traffic off of local roads. And I think the Harris Street example here is a great one of exactly um, the improvements we need to make to make sure we're taking cars off of local roads and putting them onto regional roads. Um, I know this was the product of a, a lengthy engineering study that went into this. And I know in the public hearing some of that material will be, will be shared with the commission just talking about exactly how this will reduce wait times at that light but also take cars off of Harris Street and I think ultimately it's a, a good proposal and you know everything you've seen here certainly Suffolk Downs will be exacerbating these issues but yeah you know, I think if we're all being honest a lot of these are also long-standing issues that this work will help to correct and I think this is great work and um, look forward to seeing this work take place and I hope you all support it thank you so uh, with that, uh, do I hear a motion to move these items to public hearing uh, next month? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'll we'll make a motion to move these items to a public hearing. Okay, second. A second. So ordered. We look forward to seeing you in April, and I'm sure we can get this one bone of contention worked out. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, we just have a couple of requests now. Uh, schedule 8 of Title 10, parking restrictions generally by adding a no parking from here to corner sign at the intersection of Patriot Parkway and Pitcon Street. Uh, Councillor Cogliandro could not make it here this evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and Traffic Commissioners. I am unable to attend the meeting, but hope this motion will be sent to public hearing. I file this at the request of the residents in the area. There is a business at the end of Patriot Parkway that often uses public parking spots and does not abide by the footage required from an intersection for parking. I believe signage would help the issue. Thank you for taking this matter up tonight. It is graciously appreciated, and this is Ward 3 City Councilor. Anthony Cogliandro. Uh, do I hear a motion to move this to a public hearing? Motion, Mr. Chairman. Second. All in favor. 
Um, and then the last item is to continue discussion in regards to parking, handicap parking at 37 Barrett Street. Ralph, do you have some? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've been in contact with the resident, and I've also had Laurie on the emails that have been going back and forth with the resident trying to get uh, a copy of the registration showing that the vehicle is registered at that address. Um, and it's been ongoing since last month as far as soon as I actually, I actually talked to her the other day and I was supposed to get a copy of it on Tuesday. <laughs> she didn't send it to me. And then she said she was going to send it to me yesterday, did not send it to me. I also explained to her um, that first we would need that. And then secondly, that we would need to take a look if we actually have enough space to put a handicap spot there because of the hydrant um, and the driveway opening. Um, it's, by law, it's really not supposed to be a legal spot. It's supposed to be so many feet away from a from a hydrant. Mm -hmm. And as a city, we I don't believe we can put a handicap sign there uh, if it's not the correct the correct footage. Mm -hmm. If a car parks there illegally without a sign there, that's up to the police to go there and tag it if it's there. But it's to the will of the traffic commission to see if there's actually enough footage there to put a handicap sign. Okay. I myself, I don't believe so, but I can't make that call. But we still also have not gotten the the registra copy of the registration showing the address. So it's okay. to the will of the traffic commission if they want to table it still to get that. But I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at it. Okay, I haven't. I will uh, go there tomorrow and measure it out. Uh, once you get the uh, registration, we can bring it back up. And, uh, until that time, we can just table it until yeah. you have that into your possession. Is that okay? Matter table. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. Second. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Christine.